So just start, go ahead, right? Yep. Okay, let me get started here. I've already screwed up a little bit here. Uh, but welcome to the webinar. My name is Bill Jensen. As I said, you are in my front room. Welcome to front room in Salt Lake City. Uh, I have a fireplace in the background, uh, but it's 85 degrees, so I didn't put a fire in for a fireside chat, okay? Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Utah and a consultant with Ancora Press and co-author of the Tough Kid uh, series. And uh, just to show you, this is what I look like in real life at the university. That's one of my better pictures, trying to look benign to the graduate students. And um, what I would like to do, and I'll repeat this in just a, a second, the way the webinar is going to be broken out, it's going to have two parts to it. I'm going to give a general overview of the concepts of what a Tough Kid is. Then we'll go into the Tough Kid book and the Tough Kid uh, toolbox. And then after that, I'm going to answer any questions that you may have, but I'd like to turn it over to Nick now and let him ask the technical aspects of how you ask questions. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick, and you should see now our full team here. So we're going to ask that you put any questions for Bill that you hope he can answer in the Q&A. At, right at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you have a Q&A and a chat. We're going to use that to capture all the questions, and then hopefully Elizabeth and Caitlin will have some time to uh, pick some good ones out for Bill. The webinar is being recorded, so if you have to jump off, know that you're going to get a link from us so you can watch it again. And uh, feel free to use the chat and uh, share your thoughts. So with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Bill. All right, thanks, Nick. Appreciate that. Okay, let's get started here. Um, introducing, as I said today, I'm going to be introducing the webinar, the Tough Kid Book. And you have to realize that the Tough Kid Book is uh, sort of a, a conceptualization of what a tough kid is and a definition. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. It's really important for me to have you understand our perspective on what a tough kid is and what motivates a tough kid and the best ways to intervene with that that student. Uh, the Tough Kid uh, Toolbox is different. It's a conglomeration or collection of freestanding interventions. And uh, it really helps a great deal to understand why we pick those interventions and how we use them. If you understand the conceptualization and the system that we have for Tough Kids, and this is based, I've been doing this now for 42 years. So our ideas are based on thousands of kids that we've educated and treated over the years. And nobody has all the answers, that's clearly for sure, and I'm not right all the times, but this is our perspective, if you will, okay? So the Tough Kid Toolbox is a collection of freestanding interventions. But also the Tough Kid Books and Toolbox is a part of a collection, and this is just a few of the collection of a series or suite of the uh, Tough Kid series. I have a parent book, a principal book, a new teacher book, uh, functional behavior assessment book, bullying uh, aspects. So it really runs the gamut and looks at a lot of different areas for tough kids. But it's important for me to have uh, the users of a tough kid to understand our assumptions about a tough kid. Now you may not agree with these and that's fine, but at least you know what our perspective is. But the number one assumption, uh, assumption for tough kids is that we manage them. We don't cure these kids and we don't claim to cure them. Um, I taught childhood psychopathology for 38 years at the University of Utah, read the literature every year. Nobody has a silver bullet to cure these kids. If they claim that, I really acclaim the veracity of that statement. We, we are in a management business as I view it. And if you're a parent and you have children yourself, you know you're in a management business you know, with, with your own children. Uh, people often say, well, when is he gonna come around, Dr. Jensen? When will he buy into the system? Uh, I don't want to shock anybody, but we think it's about age 25. So we're in the management business all the way through basic education. And that figure 25 is based on a lot of data, but also it's based on incarceration data for a lot of young adults. Assumption number two, there are multiple causes for tough kids. It's not just one thing. Again, it's very simplistic to think that there's one little thing that causes being a tough kid. And if you just tighten down that little nut or bolt, that kid is gonna operate at 100% efficiency. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, we oftentimes will blame parents for tough kids and surely they, they are involved, but believe it or not, parents oftentimes, uh, aside from blaming their significant others, blame educators for their, their child. But there's all sorts of reasons. Even people say, well, genetics, yeah. Uh, to be in the tough kid category, it's four to one males to females. And we know that basically, you know, being male or female has a genetic base to it. 
And we also know this, that what he does at school, he does at home. And what he does at home, he generally does at school. So blaming each other is really counterproductive. This is my favorite cartoon of all cartoons because it gets this idea across so well. But it's parent-teacher conference night. And you got a parent-teacher night. And you got one of the, the people there, adults, both of them are shredded, by the way, saying, oh, you must be Timmy's dad. I'm Timmy's teacher. That's pretty much how it works the majority of the time. Assumption number three, and that assumption is this, positives work best with tough kids. Uh, adversives uh, have been tried, they've been overused with tough kids, and I'm not a goody two-shoes. I believe that you have to use mild adversives sometimes with tough kids, just as you do with your own children at home. But these kids, tough kids, are three times immune to punishment and adversities. That means they can take three times before they'll even start changing their behavior. But what they're very unused to are positives. Positives are underutilized in both educators and parents. We overestimate the positives we give tough kids. We generally overuse adversities. You're gonna need both, but overwhelmingly positives. Uh, and the last one I like is what we call the mystery assumption. And this is just a silly assumption. And I, I got this from a teacher in Chicago years ago who was gonna take her class of tough kids, self-contained class of tough kids to the Field Institute, the museum there. And um, she taught him all kinds of tough, uh, all types of museum, social skills, behavior, and etiquette, you know, not to touch things, not to run, and not to bug people, not to steal anything. Uh, and she said, you know, Dr. Jensen, the moment we walk into the museum, it all went out the window. And that's how it generally goes with social skills training. She says they were running everywhere, touching, and the guards were there. And she said, we came up upon this one exhibit. And she said, it transfixed the kids. She said, it was a giant banner. And it uh, said uh, on the banner behind this uh, curtain, because there was a curtain there, uh, is the world's most interesting primate. And so they pulled back the curtain. And of course, there was a mirror. And so they looked at themselves in the mirror and thought, oh, we're the world's most interesting primates. And they closed the curtain. And they were down looking at another exhibit. And she said, not five minutes later, she hears a scream and a thud. And she immediately looks for Rocky because everybody's got a Rocky in their classroom. And when you hear a scream or a thud, you know, it's best to find out where they're at first. And sure enough, he was gone. And what he had done is he'd slipped back to that exhibit unobserved and gone up behind the curtain and was waiting for the next customer. And it happened to be this, this elderly lady walking up in a, with a walker and a cane hanging off the side. And Rocky's right behind the curtain, ready to spring. And she pulls the curtain back and he jumps out and says, boo, and she picks up the cane and whacks him over the head and puts him out after she screams. But the whole point with this, the teacher says, is she says, some of their, te some of their behaviors are, are so outlandish, but they're funny. And if you let these tough kid behaviors offend you, you're probably not gonna be a good educator for them. They, you know, they amuse me and they've amused me for 42 years, all the silly things that they do and all the silly things that we do also, okay? You have to like the kids because if you dislike them and dislike the, you know, their behavior, you should probably switch to another profession. The Tough Kid series is evidence-based. Uh, provided in the books are uh, a, uh, a site that Encore has that you can download and look at all the research that's been done on the techniques. So somebody says, you know, is it evidence-based? We've been doing evidence-based work for years and years and years. And just as a, a, an indicator, here's the, some of the research on mystery motivators. There are 45, 45 research papers, not papers, but research peer-reviewed articles, dissertations and master theses on just mystery motivators. And we're doing a meta-analysis on them. So nothing has gone into the series that has not been research validated. Okay, how do the kids fit into the PBS MTSS models? Well, tough kids are externalizers. That means their behaviors affect uh, individuals external to them, peers, parents, and teachers. They are not internalizers, uh, kids who are depressed, phobic, or anxious. They're externalizers. And so it, they really stand out in, in people's minds, eyes, these behaviors, because they really bother people. And they're actually the 500 pound gorilla uh, on the top of the PBIS triangle. The PBIS triangle is incredible. It's worked well, foundations, PBIS. I mean, it's, it's incredibly uh, great model, advanced the education system, 
light years. But the place that it has, I think, the most difficulty, and you may disagree with me, is right at the top with Tough Kids. And that's what this series is geared up for, our Tough Kids at the very top of that pyramid. Okay, we have a definition of Tough Kids. They don't particularly like labels. You know, I use labels, I believe in labels. For science, I believe in it for research, for classification. But when we start to use them educationally and clinically, oftentimes we give a label to a kid, we immediately drop the, our expectations for that kid. And how many times have I heard, always emotionally disturbed, you can't expect anything from him for that, or he's ADHD. We, we like our definition, it's a much broader definition. But as I said, uh, tough kids are externalizers. That means they have behavioral excesses which affects others external to them. And these behaviors are things like non-compliance. And non-compliance is the signature behavior of a tough kid. Uh, they're aggressive, uh, both physically and uh, verbally. They are argumentative. It gets them in all kinds of trouble. They're argumentative until the cows come home. And they are also, they destroy property. And they also are off task. Now I've highlighted non-compliance and off task here in yellow because we call these keystone behaviors. I'm gonna explain what that is in a second, but they are very signature behaviors of a tough kid. The average tough kid is on task in a classroom 50% of the time. Now that's not every tough kid, but it's the vast majority of tough kids. And we have data on over 3000 kids just in Utah showing how they are off task about 50% of the time. But oftentimes what we forget in this definition, and this is absolutely critical if you use my materials, are the behavioral excesses. We forget the behavioral deficits. And the behavioral deficits for tough kids include this. They're what we call contingency governed. They are not rule governed. Most kids are rule governed. That means they've internalized a rule from their family, community, church. And they use that rule to govern and guide their behavior in uncertain and unsupervised situations. Tough kids are not like that. And they are contingency governed, the research shows, which means the next thing in their environment, which captures their attention, will also control their behavior, will also control their behavior. Uh, I do not know any programs that are research validated that can teach rule governed behavior. The best that we've been able to come up with in my research groups are teaching tough kids to be self-managed. And we'll talk more about it as we go along. They have poor social skills. Their social skills are two years behind their peers in the sixth grade. This is Oregon data, by the way, out of, out of the University of Oregon, Gerald Patterson. They are two years behind their peers. That means they act younger, but also they try to dominate social situations. So oftentimes they will be, well, Hill Walker has beautiful data on this. He shared with me years ago. The average tough kid that put in with a set of non-affected uh, average kids will be rejected by those kids in an unsupervised way in about 45 minutes to, to an hour. And then they're academically deficient. 80% of tough kids are academically deficient. This is primarily in the reading area. And the long-term research data shows if there's anything we can do for tough kids to help them in the long run, it is to teach them basically to read. Because if you can't read in the long run, and you, you can't fill out the job application, and you can't read <clears throat> the job description, you are not going to do very well as a young adult. So back to my, my highlighted uh, keystone behaviors. See the little arch there? Well, the keystone rock in the middle holds that arch together. And the moment you take that keystone out, all the other rocks in that arch falls. And that might be a bad thing if you're an arch, but it's a good thing if you're a tough kid. Because we know if we can manage the keystone behaviors, then a lot of the other behaviors that... that that sort of uh, orbit that keystone will also change for the positive. So we know that if we can change non-compliance to compliant behavior, we get a reduction in aggression and non-compliance almost automatically. And if we can change the off task 50%, being on task 75 to 80% of the time, it displaces a lot of the other problematic behaviors without having to develop a special intervention for those behaviors. So the keystone behaviors are important, or pin, uh, uh, pin behaviors are very important to us. One of the most important things to understand, I think, is po uh, coercive pain control. Now, as I indicated, there's a lot of different reasons uh, the tough kids are tough kids. 
But one thing they almost all have in common is that they utilize uh, coercion or pain control in the manipulation of others. And to really examine this sort of thing, I'd like to show you a little example of a coercive child talking with uh, his mother. This is the cupcake kid, and it's really worth seeing this on YouTube. Nick, can I switch this back to you? Hey, Nick, I think we're missing sound. Yeah, I can't hear it. Hey guys, I heard that this the video played, but there was no sound. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Uh, you want me to play it again, Bill? I'm sorry. I think it was a technical snafu on my end. Sure. Yep, it would be great. Okay, here we go. He's doing little pop-ups, but he doesn't listen. But look, look, honey, honey, look at, look at this. Right now, they can't do anything if they can't get everything out of the floor. If they can break everything down. I'm not breaking anything down. I'm just letting you know Linda, you cannot Linda, have Linda, cupcakes Linda, for Linda, dinner. Linda, Linda, like this thing, I never belong to you. Anything, you can't get anything and anything and anything. I'm done arguing with you. I'm not arguing with you. You need to listen <laughs> to the things that I say because I'm the mom and I'm the dog. Listen to me all the time. To... That's perfect. That's perfect. So I go back to share screen now, Nick. Yep, go back to share your PowerPoint, Bill. Sorry for that, folks. Hey, that worked okay, though. Great. Well, you know, that's funny, but in a funny way, it's not funny. Uh, and that being this. This is what we mean by, by coercion. Here you have the adult. Here you have a child. The, the adult wants to get the child to do something. So they generally ask, you know, wouldn't you like to? Using a, a question format. The child commonly ignores you. The parent then tries to talk him into it or cajole him into it. Now the child will delay you or say, you know, in just a minute or uh, uh, just give me some time. Wait just a second. So oftentimes then we get upset. We yell. The child gives us excuses at that point in time. We bump it up a notch. And oftentimes as educators or parents, we come up with an ultimate consequence. We threaten. And those consequences we cannot follow through with oftentimes. That's why the Tough Kid Materials has put a lot of thought into what you can really do and you cannot really do. Now the child becomes angry and aggressive. And at this point in time, oh, excuse me, 60% uh, of the time the adult withdraws the request. And every time you withdraw the request, every one of these things are rewarded. Every one of these things are intensified and will increase over time. And that is really a lot of the design of the Tough Kid interventions, such as precision requests and group contingencies and sure I will interventions, is to stop this coercive cycle. Uh, it's randomly rewarded. It, it, it reinforces microaggression bursts. Uh, it impedes social skills development. That's why these students are oftentimes shunned by their peers and reduces academic learning because you know, you're backing off your teacher with coercion. Okay, now there's another core concept before we move on to the books that's really important to understand with tough kids. And we have learned this over the years. And people often wonder why we use some of the techniques we use. We use a lot of precision, uh, a lot of group contingencies in the tough kid uh, materials. And this is why. It's called behavioral contagion. And this is been investigated by Tom Deshaun at the University of Oregon, incredibly well researched, where they shows shows how misbehaviors are contagious. And I want you to look at this these graphs down here. If you look at the left down here, they these little dots here are hundreds and hundreds of kids. The two little graphs on the bottom down here are uh, average kids with no disabilities, no difficulties at all. These here are hundreds and hundreds of tough kids, both males and females. But one of the things that you can see at age 10, these kids start to hang out with other tough kids, no matter anywhere they're at. And they have a dramatic influence on each other. So we like to say you are no longer in individual interventions. 
you're into basic standard group control. And it, it bleeds over into truancy. If you look at this, you could fit this graph almost right on the other graph. And this is where peers really start to influence others not to go to school and have high rates of absenteeism. And boy, and Cora has some great materials on this with, with Jesse uh, Sprick on, on managing this and using functional behavior assessment. But it even, it even goes over into substance abuse because we know they influence each other. So what's happening here is you are in peer management. You're no longer in individual management. And uh, it's, it's really important to understand that. Now, this concept is also very important to understand. I love this little image I got off of Google Images. Tough kids are impulsive. Remember, you, we said they're, they're contingency uh, uh, motivated. They're not rule governed. They have some contingency that captures them. This little boy got captured by a pencil just moments before, all right? So it means that if you look at this graph again, this is from the same Achenbach uh, study of hundreds of kids. These are tough kid females. These are tough kid males. They are incredibly impulsive from age five to 18. So it means that supervision is absolutely critical. Main line of defense in managing tough kid behavior is making sure you, they are supervised. And you know, I think the foundation's material is so great uh, on the, uh, the basic supervision components and champs, and also tough kids, we really emphasize supervision as a critical element in the management of these kids. Now, last concept, then I'll just summarize it and we'll go on to the books here. I hear over and over and over again, uh, tough kids are just not motivated. They're just not interested in academics. It's not in their fiber and being or personality. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe it's a personality issue, and I don't believe it's one from home. Uh, I believe it's something else. And I like to, I like to say this to uh, educators. How many non-motivated kindergarten kids do you see coming to school? Not very many. They're really motivated to show up the first day, the vast majority. They're there to drink the chocolate milk, not take a nap, rock and roll, and have a good time. How many non-motivated secondary students do you see? They're everywhere. You trip off of them. Something happened from kindergarten to secondary. In all those years, something happened. And then I started to read this research from Stanford, and I thought, that's the reason why. It's not a personality variable. It's not disinterest. This is what I think non-motivation is. And you may disagree with me, and that's fine. But I think it's like heavy metal poisoning. And people think heavy metal poisoning, you know, the professor's gone nuts. No, I don't think so. You know, with heavy metal poisoning, what happens is uh, if you ingest heavy metals, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, uh, they bond to your, your tissue, your body tissue. You can't flush them out. They're not like other poisons. They, they molecularly bond and they stick with you for many years, actually. And uh, so that's why they, they indicate to pregnant women, don't eat a lot of uh, tuna fish sandwiches because tuna fish eat a lot of little fish and the mercury gets built up. And then when you consume that tuna fish sandwich, it bonds with your tissue and can cause neurological damage. Well, people say, well, what does that have to do with uh, motivation? This is what it has to do with, with motivation. And that is the research out of Stanford showing that you will remember, this just, just astounded me, but it's so true. You will remember a negative event that's happened to you in your past about 80% better than you can recall and remember a positive event. Isn't that amazing? You will remember 80% better something that was adversive and negative, a failure to you, than you will something positive. You will remember when you were shown as a failure rather than as the star student. So what I believe, and this is what the Tough Kid book now really engenders, we believe you build up those negative academic failures in school, just like eating tuna fish sandwiches. You get them in your system, they bond with you, and they do not leave. They stick with you over the years. And tough kids who are impulsive to begin with, uh, they may ha have a deficit background in reading and the basics to begin with, start to build those up over and over and over. And then finally, they just quit. Finally, they will just not try any academics because it has been adversive. Now, you may think that that's a, 
an oval polyanistic view of non-motivation, but I don't think so. We think the only way you get a non-motivated tough kid to be motivated over time is my favorite movie, What About Bob? Richard Dreyfuss and Bill Murray, okay? And the therapy they used in that really worked wasn't death therapy in What About Bob? It was baby steps therapy, little teeny baby steps that are successful. So a lot of the materials in the Tough Kid book are teeny baby steps that make you successful, particularly in academics where we break it down and really highlight your successes over and over again so it sticks with you rather than the negatives. Okay, let me see here. And I love this. This is out of the new Tough Kid book. It's got the Tough Kid stuck at the bottom of an aquarium with a lot of fish, you know, and we talk about lead, uh, uh, heavy metal poisoning. So, all right, here in summary, here in summary are the basic concepts before we jump off into the books now. I think you'll understand. Basically, uh, we like our Tough Kid definition rather than the label, behavioral excesses and deficit with keystone behaviors highlighted, uh, those being noncompliance and off-task behaviors. Number two, we have tough kid assumptions. It's multiply caused. And if you don't believe it's multiply caused, and it's one thing, for those of you out there with, with more than one child in your family, you just tell me how many of you have exactly the same type of children. There's different night and day than most of them. That's because I've had children too, and I understand that. If the environment controlled everything, let me tell you, we'd have a lot of children who are identical, and it's the exact opposite. Positives work better. We're in the management system, and like the kids, they can tell it when you like them. It makes a huge difference. Uh, it's critical to understand pain control because it's the most used technique by tough kids to manipulate others, including peers, teachers, and parents. You're in the group management, particularly after age 10. The most important other being in a tough kid life uh, is another peer and much less another tough kid peer. So it's positive group management is where we're at. Lack of motivation, I truly believe it's just like heavy metal poisoning. It builds up in your system and it's a long trudge to get over that, but it can be done and we've done it with many, many, many tough kids. And supervision is absolutely critical because these kids are impulsive. They're contingency governed. They are not rule governed. And then there's another area I'd just like to mention briefly because this is going to be a challenge for us, particularly in the fall. We're going to have a lot of kids coming back to school, hopefully. They're going to be coming from unstructured environments that they've been in in months. And a lot of kids will be tough kids. We're going to get those anyway. But we're going to have a lot of other kids who sort of show a degree of tough kidness because they've been isolated for months and months and months. And a lot of the techniques that we're going to be talking about out of these two books really apply to kids who have been COVID uh, isolated for all of these months. So I will move on now to the books. Tough kid book first. Remember, this is a book of conceptualizations and a system, but it also has a lot of basic standard intervention techniques that go along with it. Uh, the first part of this, the introduction, it talks about how this fits into PBIS, MTSS, and how you can use that. We've already talked a little bit about that. But the basic breakdown of this book and all the chapters, it will have pointer boxes in each chapter embedded. So if we present you with a concept, we will refer you in relationship to that concept, to other resources outside. That's why it's called the pointer box. We're pointing to other resources, not Ancora's resources, not Bill Jensen's resources. These are resources that are broadly out there. Number two, we have a great section on downloadable files. A lot of the, the materials, a lot of the forms are, are uh, included in with the book. And you can either Xerox them, a lot of them, or they can be downloaded from Ancora. And a lot of them are both in English and Spanish. And by the way, you can download the basic standard research articles that support these techniques. Um, we, we'll give you technique tips. When we give you uh, a technique, then we may give you a technique tip on how to enhance it and where it kind of comes from. Like a lot of people run around saying, well, you ought to be po more positive. Well, how much more positive? Is it one to one, three to one, four to one, five to one? This is a technique tip here that we took out of the research literature where we sort of decided it's a Goldilocks uh, technique. About It's about four to one positive to any minor adversive you give a tough kid. That is bridged between some authors that say it's five to one, some say it's three to one. We just settled on the Goldilocks era there. Uh, we give you technique cautions. If we give you a technique and there might be an unexpected uh, outcome 
with that technique as a side effect, we will warn you about that. For example, if we say uh, you should use differential uh, attention with a child, which involves extinction, we'll warn you that you're more like you're likely to get an extinction burst initially before the behavior improves. It'll likely get worse before it gets better. The same with using basically some of the simple timeout techniques we use. We'll give you a technique caution right off the bat that says it is impossible to be timed out of a negative environment. Unless that environment is reinforcing for you to be in, uh, I don't care what kind of te uh, timeout technique you use, it ain't going to be successful. And then every chapter has a nutshell, and that's just the summary. We try to go through and highlight all the points that we presented. Okay, this is the first chapter uh, in the Tough Kid book, and you can see I've tried to lay it out, and a lot of it we've discussed already. It has behavioral excesses and deficits. We've talked about the needs of social skills and academics. It has a whole section on assessment in here, uh, on what we consider reliable assessment behavior checklist, checklist for social skills, functional behavior assessment. But it also has this last section, which is absolutely critical to the tough kid materials, and that it's rules. And everybody and their dog, including Matt's dog and my dog, talk about rules. But when you really look at the research on rules, it's really scant and it's really difficult. And there are a lot of myths that go along with rules. And we'd like just to go through some of these. Uh, first of all, you know, you know, there can be some pretty dumb rules out there that, that educators. This is Mrs. Muttner's few rules. And I love these. It's a cartoon. I love some of these rules. It says here, you know, no wearing weird clothes. Uh, there's one here I love, no dorky hairstyle. Love that one. That would apply to me now not being able to get a haircut during this pandemic. <laughs> what I used to love to put up when I gave tests at, at, the, at the university for graduate students, and they'd always laugh is no, no, no crying during the tests. And I'd also put down no sweating during tests. These are silly rules. They're not. This is actually a photograph taken by one of Natalie Allen's students, who's a co-author on the Tough Kid book, of an actual list of rules. And that's not a very good photograph because we had to do this pretty clandestinely. But I was, I was amazed at the rules, how many there are, how foolish they are. These are real rules a teacher's posted. These are misspelled rules. And if you look at some of these rules, they are amazing. Like, don't be a snitch. That was somebody really put that on a wall. Don't be a snitch. Don't retaliate. Oh, uh, so we put a little box of some of the best we got out of this list. You know, don't retaliate. Uh, don't take your shoes off. I don't know where that came from. Uh, you know, don't rip off your name tag. There's don't be a snitch. No bad attitudes. There's one in here I really love. Don't roll your eyes. I use that with my own granddaughter. Don't roll your eyes. But these are foolish, foolish rules. This is what we think make good rules. There are myths about rules. And these are the myths about rules we think exist out there. And you may disagree. Uh, number one is, uh, we don't think you should have the students set the rules. We think you should set the rules because your rules are your expectations for their behaviors. They should not decide on what those are. You should decide on what they are. Number one reason is if you let them decide, you won't be ready the very first day because you won't have your rules in place. Number two is you're going to have a lot of your goody two-shoes kids participate in setting those rules. Your tough kids aren't. They're going to wait in the background to break those rules. We can find no research to validate that letting kids set their rules will improve their behaviors. If you must do this, we suggest that you let them pick a one-class rule. There's one rule they get to pick for the class, but not all the rules, okay? And we think that your rules should not be ambiguous, higher-order Values. They should be almost a checklist on what you expect out of the child when they walk in the, the door at 8 a.m. and you can look at them. And remember, small things count. It ain't the big things. So if you let little things go, big things happen and follow. And if you really want to read a great book on that, read The Tipping Point. This is how what we think about rules. Number one, you set them. If at all possible, let them set one, okay? They shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be ambiguous values or reflect higher order ideals. They ought to be your behaviors. They ought to pass the flash test. And I cannot impress how important this has been for us over the years. The flash test is just simply this. Stop a kid, ask them a rule, and then ask them to give you the definition. If the kids are not giving you similar definitions for that rule, you've got a bad rule because there's many interpretations of it. And just... Don't stop the uh, goody two-shoes kids and ask them what the rule means. Ask the tough kids 
because if they don't understand what the rules are, you're going to get a lot of, of you know, uh, misinterpretations and inappropriate behaviors. Your rules should be stated in a positive way. You only need five or six. You don't need to be like Mrs. Mutner. And this is so important. And I think the most overlooked issue in behavior management systems, your rules should be directly connected to your behavior management system in your classroom. I see a lot of rules that is nothing more than wallpaper on the wall. There's no connection to the consequences that are happening in that classroom with the rules that are posted on that classroom. So let's go ahead and move on to some other areas here. Um, this is chapter two. It focuses on unique positive techniques, mystery motivators. There are myths about positive reinforcement. And the myths are really destructive for tough kids. And there's risks, what myths, I think, what is by Alfie Cohen's punished by rewards, which is if you give external rewards, you kill internal motivation. There's not really good research to back that up. Uh, and every, every presenter, including, you know, Mr. Cohen, uh, charges a fee for his, his presentations. Uh, and that's an incentive. It's how you give those incentives. And we talk about how you do that. Don't give it for busy work. Don't do it for things. Don't give rewards for things that can't, kids can't accomplish. Yeah, you'll kill internal motivation. But you find out there are ways to do this where you actually enhance their motivation over time. Number two is people say, well, you know, to be fair, I've got to give it to everyone. No. That's not fairness. Fairness is defined by Webster. It's giving you what you uh, need to be equally successful. Not everybody gets the same thing. It's what you need to be equally successful. And my tough kids need incentives, particularly in the academic area where they may have been poisoned motivationally to keep on going and starting to have successes. We talk in here a lot about novel reinforces, mystery motivators, unique delivery systems. Let me see what I've got here. We're famous for mystery motivators. I'm known as the mystery motivator guy. Mystery motivator is nothing more than an envelope with a question mark on it, a piece of paper with a reward written on it, sealed in, inside with a pencil with that. And it, basically, that's what those 45 articles are on. This is a very inexpensive way to deliver incentives. We also have a, really like to use these called, we call them magic pens or developer pens by Crayola. If you notice these pens here on one end, they have invisible ink and you can put in these boxes uh, an X or an M and when the child achieves what they need to do that day, uh, let's say they're on a special contract or it could be a, a number of things, uh, you let them color it in with one of these colored tips. If the X shows up, or, uh, automatically they get what's in the envelope, which is pasted here. And um, we've moved that up now. We've had a lot of teachers start to use these infrared pens. Uh, they're just like the magic decoder pens because all you have to do is a black light and, and kids really love and it keeps they're variable they keep kids guessing we use reward spinners and people always say well will that work with adolescents yeah it work with adolescents it works with their parents look at wheel of fortune on tv one of the most successful games store it works with full professors with tenure we've used you know it's used in las vegas but we use it with tough kids uh, oftentimes they deliver incentives. So if they make the, the, their, the behaviors, we let them spin this, whatever it lands on, they get on this menu. It allows you to vary the value from very inexpensive number four generic yogurt uh, types of rewards to very expensive trips to Hawaii. And you can even include a mystery motivator. And if you're so inclined on the internet, there's one you can have free. This is put out by the uh, National Consortium of Teachers of Mathematics. And this is an electro electronic spinner, and you can define it. You can change the wedges uh, because it changes the probability. That's why they have it up there. We use it to reward kids. Uh, chapter three is reductive techniques. Now, remember, reductive techniques are overly used with tough kids. We really prefer to highlight the, the positive techniques that are basically standard used for tough kids. But these can inc inc include forms of... Uh, 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 mild times of uh, ti uh, timeout procedures, precision requests. We really have an emphasis on using positive reductive techniques like differential attention, which a lot of teachers know as, as proximity praise, the Sure I Will program. I'll let you look at the book to, to, to get a sense for what they are. Um, this is what I particularly like out of this chapter, though. It's called The Quiet Classroom. And we really emphasize group contingencies. And the way we design group contingencies, people often say, well, that's not fair if everybody fa fails because one kid sets them up to fail. Well, our group contingencies are designed that that doesn't happen. We use what's called uh, independent group contingencies, which by the way, this one is the quiet classroom. And what this is, is we know that 
The louder the classroom, the higher the problematic behavior oftentimes. And this allows you to tone down the, the noise in a classroom. And it uses an app that you can get free or you can pay 95, 99 cents for the deluxe, which will keep track of your decibel level by, by second in your classroom. And you can set the uh, total maximum decibel levels that you want and not reveal it to them until after like a certain period of time, like in seat work. And it can be a, a, a group contingency. It is incredibly effective and it is in the, uh, the book and has been well researched. Uh, we have advanced sections in this book also. Advanced academic sections uh, like cover, copy, and compare, uh, motivating and evaluating, but it also has a uh, real high emphasis on, on academic learning time and explicit and direct instruction. And we rely very heavily on Marilyn Sprick and Anita Archer here on a lot of our strategies we've included in these books. We have advanced uh, uh, behavioral strategies uh, like clean your plate or tootling. Uh, home notes and contracts. Uh, the tootling I like is it's. Oh, I should it should say put ups. Not, okay, I misspelled that one. There's always a typo. Sorry about that. But tootling is a put up or saying something positive to another child. It's teaching a tough kid to say positive things to another one. We thought we got this by Matt Sprick, the CEO of the company, and the editor, Sarah. We thought they hadn't seen this. But here you have the kid giving a, uh, a, a put up to this kid by saying, hey, dude, you got your butt in the seat before the bell rang. Good job. We found out they, they knew all about this. Okay, But this is one of the advanced techniques in here. Uh, we have a home note program. Home notes or daily behavior report cards are used by 65% of all schools. And we, we introduce what we call the electronic home notes in a pointer box. We've developed a, a home note that can be done with Google Docs on an iPad that is incredibly effective and does not require paper that goes directly to the parent. We also use self-monitoring as a technique to change behaviors. Remember, self-monitoring is important to us because it is a way to get kids to be contingency governed. And our technique is called on task in a box and is freestanding. So uh, and then we have our, our last section here, uh, chapter five, is getting tough kids back into general ed. 80% of tough kids fail when they go back. And this whole chapter is built around getting them to be successful when you send them back from special ed or special placements to general ed. And things like Lucky Charms, which I'm not going to tell you, but it's not a serial, is an incredibly good generalization technique. And one thing in here I really have loved, and it is the Teacher Pleaser Social Skills Training Program. We have took 30 of the most uh, prized behaviors by teachers. This is based on a thousand teachers from Hill Walker and the top five. And we put them in a program, which is included in this book and how to teach those, those social skills and have a child, a student self record those behaviors when they go back. So I want to move on now to the tough kid uh, toolbox and then open it up to any, any questions that you may have. Okay. The structure of each section of the toolbox. Remember this is, Understanding interventions. Tough Kid Book is a conceptualization and system. This is going to be a set of interventions. But each one of the interventions starts with a description of that intervention. Step for implementing that intervention. How do you improve it once you get it going? It even has pointer boxes like the Tough Kid Book. How to troubleshoot it. We go through all the types of issues that can pop up when you do use that uh, intervention and how you can even make it better and then we give you the hard copy reproducibles, as we did with the Tough Kid book, that are downloadable. A lot of them are back of each of the chapters in this book also. And again, they're, you can get them in English and Spanish. Then these are the major sections of the, of the book. Now, each of these sections reflect the structure that I just showed you on the previous slide. All of these reflect, oh, shoot, I did something there. Good going. Can't believe. I think you're good from there, Bill, to just go uh, from current slide. All right. Thank you, Nick. All right. Great. All of these are broken down with the, just the, the basic standard structure that I had just presented. Uh, steps, troubleshooting, what have you. Descriptions. This is an example. You can see here's a description of the mystery motivator section. We start off with that. Then we go through the basic standard steps, troubleshooting, how you make it even better. And then these are some of the reproducible forms that you can get in the back or downloadable uh, pointer boxes and uh, downloadable files for that. 
Now, here is the first section has mystery motivators. It also has in uh, the, the next section is home notes, uh, how to set them up. And we give you the basic template for home notes. Here's an elementary one, and then there's a secondary one. And same thing, troubleshooting, how to get them to work well. We also have uh, a technique that I would mentioned before called clean your plate. This is an interesting technique. This is a technique that's based on research done by Glenn Dunlop, which shows that if you have a task that has several parts to it, and you want a tough kid to get that, do that task, rather than have them start with the one that you want them to start with, although they have to complete all of them, is you let them choose. Choice makes a difference here. And the technique is called clean your plate, and we give them a plate with all the tasks on, and they get to choose the academic task they go through until they've cleaned their plate. It's a really neat technique, and this is one that I was introduced to by Natalie Allen. It's a really great technique. Uh, this is one I, I, we invented a long time ago. This is called the yes-no program. It uh, is a reinforcement technique that if you follow the classroom rules, we catch you doing it, like she's catching the tough kid there, and we have a little laminated card. We'll put your name on it. We'll circle yes. We'll put it in a jar. And the next time we catch a different student, see, we're linking a student uh, following the rules, getting a card in a jar with a yes on it. If you break a rule, we'll put a circle and a no in there. Now, at the end of the day or for secondary at the end of the week, we'll, we'll pull one of these cards out. And if it's a, a yes card, the class gets what's in a mystery motivator. And then we uh, basically take all the yes cards out wipe them all off and, and start over again. The real trick to using this correctly is making sure you have a lot more yeses than you have noes, because if you start catching kids failing with the rules over and over again and highlighting that, it's very problematic. You wanna catch them following the rules and uh, putting them in there. And hey, Bill, you muted yourself, I think. That when did I mute myself? <laughs> it was just about five Pardon? seconds ago. When I started to talk about yes, no. Yeah. Okay. Before I muted myself, <laughs> pretty cool. I did that. My wife would like that. Uh, I uh, I was talking about the yes no program, and the yes no program here is uh, you can see the uh, teacher catching the tough kid following a rule. And uh, down here, it has happy faces and sad faces. We also give you cards with yeses and nos. We have you uh, uh, laminate these, cut them up, and, uh, and put them in a stack. And when you catch a kid following a rule, you, you circle a yes, put their name on it, and you put it in a jar. And each time you catch a kid and tie them to rule-following behavior, you put it in a jar. At the end of the day, we pull one out. If it's a happy face, they get a, uh, a mystery motivator. If it's a no, uh, they don't. Uh, and there's different variations on how to make this more successful. Some teachers have them count the number of happy faces, and there's still more happy faces than those. They still get the mystery motivator. And you won't see this, but underneath it, we also have for secondary, it's a lottery light card. It has a yes and a no on it. Instead of running it every day, we run it across the whole uh, week. And I hope you can still hear me. Um, now, the next one here we use is basically a uh, a generalization intervention technique uh, that is used. This is soda pop bottle timeout for recess. And what you do is you drink two bottles of two liter soda pop, uh, go to Home Depot, get some PCV cement uh, and paving sand, drill a hole in the little connectors on the bottom bottles, cement them with the paving sand, and we tell you how much paving sand in it. Spray circles out on your playground, put these in it, and then when children are, if they break a rule, on a playground, you tell them it's soda pop bottle timeout, and you ask them to sit in the, the circle. They turn the bottle out, and it takes about three minutes for the uh, sand to drain out. This is a very interesting, good technique, cheap. And by the way, the yes-no technique supplants a token economy. It is so much simpler than, than keeping track of points. I wanted to bring that up. Now, the next one we got off the internet, just new for this book, a teacher was using it, and I loved it. She called it glitter timeout. And instead of glitter bottle timeout, and instead of a, an hourglass made out of uh, soda pop, she went and got a standard uh, soda pop container or bottle container, went to Michael's and got uh, glitter glue and put in there, and glitter, and we tell you how to do this and how much to put in, and it's like those orbs you have at Christmas time, you turn them upside down, and when all the glitter settles down, 
Okay, well, this one, we spray paint a circle, have the uh, glitter timeout bottle in the, in, the, in the circle. Child goes in for breaking a classroom rule, tell them to turn it up and watch and tell you when all the glitter is settled to the bottom. And it takes three to four minutes. And then they ask to come out. It's a, it's a very nice, unique technique. And the idea is to make this interesting. Now, the last one is functional behavior assessment. And uh, I believe in functional behavior assessment, but I do not believe in functional behavior assessment as not tied to intervention. I, I consider that a waste of a resource. But here you have the tough kid looking at all the motivations that he should use. All the functional behavior assessments, and we keep them very simple in the tough kid toolbox and a tough kid book, are tied to interventions based on the antecedents and consequences that that function uh, uh, functional behavior assessment indicates. And we use an ABC model, which is familiar to many of you, A for antecedents, B for the behavior you're looking at, and C for the consequences. And we have an excellent pointer box in here that has been put out by Ancora that has functional behavior assessment for truancy and absences and bullying behavior. But what's really unique about these systems is that they are linked to intervention-based books that go along with them that are research-based so you can look up the antecedent, the function, and it will lead you and suggest to you a series of interventions for that particular behavior. And I particularly like this for bullying because all bullies are not the same. All bullies have different motivations and different antecedents. And this system really, really looks at that. And that's it. I'm done. I'll open it up for questions. Silence. Hi, Bill. I have a question for you from the group. Um, Heather is a special education director, and she said that in the past, they've tried to motivate um, using external rewards and was wondering about how to move to, you know, students toward internal motivation, um, toward that kind of internal autonomy and purpose. Sure. You won't like my answer, okay, because that doesn't happen in the real world. Now, it happens to a degree, and this is the degree I'll, I'll talk about, and I'll do this just briefly. I agree to you, with you. You want to move it from just material things there's some things that, that have inherent value and internalized, but uh, all of us still want external things, at least initially. The best way we know how to move it, external evaluation is to link that external reward to verbal praise from an adult, verbal praise from an adult they either respect or like a great deal. And then they slowly can fade those out over time. Will you fade them out 100%? I don't think so. You know, last time we went to Costco, there were a lot of people down there looking for external rewards. But what you can do is move away from them primarily. You can move them to internal things, particularly if you take that external reward and you link it with the behavior that you want, the behavior that you're praising that child for. That is the best way. And it's not 100 percent. And I truly do not believe you'll ever get 100 percent in society for that. And I must admit I just bought an electric bicycle, which is an external reward. And I rationalized it with my wife, who is a uh, exercise person, to my internal uh, value that it would help me get more exercise over time. So I know that's not 100% the answer you wanted, but it's the most realistic answer I have. You should not totally rely on external rewards. You should not totally rely on internal rewards, because I don't think it's going to happen in the long run. Good question. Great. Do you have time for one more, Bill? I absolutely do. Uh, one we had here was, uh, should you let on to the fact that you think misbehaviors are funny in the moment? Do you let on to the fact, you know, do you let the child know that? Oh, I, I think I think you let them know their behavior is not amusing to you. I think you let it, you know, that it's not, not funny at all, not funny to other kids if they laugh also. No, you take it very seriously when the kid jumps out from behind the curtain and scares the elderly lady half to death. Now that's done under stern circumstances. But when you get at home at night and you're talking to your significant other or your dog and your cat and you're having your glass of wine, you say, you know what? I had to really not laugh because it was a pretty funny behavior when it occurred to me. The whole point is if they offend you over time, they will build up also and you'll start to dislike these kids. They do stupid, stupid things. And some of the things they do are out and out uh, cruel, out and out aggressive, and out and out difficult, but not all of them. And uh, over the years, I've, I've really learned to like tough kids. And I'll let you in. This happened to me about, oh, 
two weeks ago with my face mask on and my gloves and I'm at the grocery store taking my life in my hands. And I'm trying to buy yeast to bake bread because everyone's baking bread. And I hear all of a sudden somebody says, Dr. Jensen, and immediately I jump, of course. And I turn around and there's a person standing there, no mask, no gloves, uh, pierced ears, tattoos, all over him, uh, mohawk hair too. That's purple. And you know what he says to me? Do you remember who I am? <laughs> I, you know, I thought I've seen thousands of tough kids and was ran a school for 12 years, but I never say, oh, I don't know who you are. I generally say, yeah, of course I, I can remember you. Difficult maybe with the name, but and then I always come up with, how's your mom doing? <laughs> because they always link in on how your mom's doing. But the reason I say that is, that student knew I liked them way back when. And that student's remembered me for 10 or 15 years and still recognizes me with a mask. And I still like that student. And my, last, you know, my second question after, how's your mom doing? Saying, are you in school or you got a job? You know, same stuff I would have said to him when he was 10 years old at the Children's Behavior Therapy Unit where I was a principal. So no. Don't laugh at the behavior at the time, but don't let them get to you over time and, you know, poison you. Because these kids are nice. They, they're really worth something. They really are worth a great deal to me. Long answer. <laughs> I think that was a great answer. And we're about, um, about out of time. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. I have, thank you for taking the time and listen to me and my screw up as I tried to get through here. And thank you, Nick, and everybody else. Uh, Caitlin, who's, who's helped me through with this is fun from my my front room. <laughs>